Uh, well, good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Just doing a quick mic check for those of you online. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Pamela, Myra? Yes, yes, I can hear you. And okay. make sure you record. I'm recording. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Oh, hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, another class of that here at Government Contractor Association. My name is Abraham Stell. I am your trainer, your instructor for the day. Uh, before we get started, I want to kind of do go around the room quickly, uh, share about your name, uh, something about your business, and the most amazing vacation you've ever been on. So, right? Or if you haven't been on it, then the most amazing vacation you want to go on. Uh, and so your name, business, and your dream vacation. We'll start right up here. Okay, um, my name is Lenita White. Uh, my business is uh, advertising and graphic design. Um, and <laughs> dream vacation. My dream vacation, well, one of, one of the, one, one of my most memorable vacations where I had the most fun, I was in, um, uh, the Brahman, Croatia. Oh, wow. And okay. we decided to uh, rent, rent a scooter. It was, 20, it was only 20 pounds to rent a scooter for all day. Uh -huh. We rented a scooter and we just rode, I mean, all over the mountains, all over the coast. It was like, that's mm -hmm. the best 20 pounds I've ever spent. <laughs> I mean, uh -huh. that was my, my, one of my most memorable videos. All right, great. And right behind you? My name is William Porter. My name is William, was it? Okay. Okay, awesome. Did you enjoy the food over there? Oh my god, I love it. Crazy. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, sweet. All right, back here. Okay. Mhm. Mm Guyana is in South America. Yeah, is that English Guyana or French Guyana? Both. Oh, you went to both? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Sweet. Well, hey, you learn all kinds of things about people. Right? <laughs> you know, that's good. All right. And then last person here. Trips. Yeah, yeah, best trip you ever taken, or your dream trip if you, if you haven't taken it yet. Um, I Um, 
my, I guess, what was the question? My dream vacation? Yeah, or a vacation that was awesome that you've been on. I would like to go to Africa. I have not been there, so mm -hmm. that's a dream vacation. And a vacation that I thought was awesome I was recently to Hawaii. And, okay. Um, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you get people envious. <laughs> All right, well, hey, um, I'll share more about myself. We go throughout the whole presentation, but I think um, when when I got married, my, my wife and I, you know, we made a decision that we're going to go visit all 50 states, right? And so we started going, you know, we got to about 13 states, and then we discovered cruising. Mm -hmm. And so we stopped doing states because cruising is a true vacation where you go, you, you're driving or to go see states. Yeah, there's a unique factor about seeing all these different states. And you know, like one of our rules is we have to spend at least one day there or one night. If you don't spend one night, that means you haven't seen enough of that location, right? And so, and so that was fun. It gave you variety. Cruising is, is like the same thing over and over, but it's the convenience of you wake up, Breakfast is ready, yeah. lunch, you know, dinner is you know, all decked out, and, and then you get to do fun stuff throughout the day, all the excursions. And so we've been doing a lot of cruising. And so, um, so I, I guess that's kind of like my ideal is vacation is do nothing and no schedule, get up when you want to get up, food is already ready, you get there to eat. And uh, so, this, so that's, that's kind of what we've been doing uh, recently. But then, uh, you know, kids, you know, you get kids in the mix, right? right. They want to go to Disneyland and Disney World and all these other places. So, so we're trying to balance all of that there. But, you know, yes, we did do a Disney cruise. Yes. <laughs> so that was a good hybrid there. <laughs> That's a good mix there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, you know, we work a lot, you know, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, you work a lot. And you have to learn to play a little bit, have a little fun along the way. And so to me, work is fun. So but I don't call it work. This is like, I get up, I go, I get to go and play golf. This is like golfing to me, right? You're just out there hitting the ball, having fun and, you know, getting your golf cart and drinking a beer and you know, just, you know, just having fun. And so to me, work is not work like most people. It's, I'm just having fun. So I can do this sort of day in, day out, and I, I won't feel like I miss anything else. So I have to learn the, the balance that my wife and kids don't think this is fun. <laughs> and that I got, I got to spend time with them and do things with them as well. So that's kind of like part of my Achilles heel is, you know, work is not work to me. Um, and so, all right, so somebody online said, I took a great trip. I took the trip, the idea trip, okay. Pamela, what was your uh, what was your uh, ideal trip? You want to share with that with us? I, I'm just you. got back from a great trip, Costa Rica, Pura Vida. Pura Vida. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was awesome. Pura Vida. Yep, pure life. The pure life. Yes, zip, volcano, zip line, hot springs, everything. So, okay, I know we gotta get back to class, but I just had to say that. All right, all right, <laughs> all right. Y'all, you, you wanna make us go down there. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about. Um, I said, we'll go ahead and dive in. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about capture management, the art of capturing government contracts. Now, who's heard of the word capture management in the past, anybody? Okay, so one person. Okay, you've heard of it? Okay, so two, everybody else kind of like, okay, I'm in for something new today. Okay, that's good. You know, because this is, you're going to be learning some governance today. And so this is all part of speaking the new language, the, the language of government contracting. So that's what we're going to be talking about, the art of capturing government contracting. Oh, before we do that, can you see this here? That's the Mona Lisa, who's the artist? No, the other one, Leonardo da Vinci. All right, and this one, I, I forgot the artist here in this art, but 
Picasso. That's a Picasso, yeah. That's a Picasso. Yeah, and what about this one? That's a, that's Picasso. No, 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 that's not Picasso. Oh, that's who's the one that has Avery? It's Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Yes. Right? And this one? This is the Last Supper. The artist. The artist? This is the Last Supper. The artist is the same artist as this. Da Vinci. And then this one is the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo. And this one, I don't know. Excuse me? Yeah. That's Dowie. Well, yeah, the last last one I, I don't remember, but uh, but you know, building your business in the government market is like art, and so we're going to be talking about business is art and, and using that as a theme throughout the whole presentation today. So a little bit about myself. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'm a small business advocate. I've started multiple companies. I've sold two companies. Uh, I've had the honor of seeing the cycles of business multiple times. Um, one of the last business I was in was in real estate. We had a construction company, a real estate investment company, a uh, real estate agency, a mortgage company, but it was all tied to real estate. In 2007, when the real estate market crashed, all of the businesses died because we were all tied to one industry. And uh, it, it was tough. And tough meaning that during that time there, we had peers that ended their own lives. That were people that were in real estate with us. And it was so tough that they thought that the only way out is to end it all. And you guys remember back in the 2008, 2009, people just like, you know, doing some crazy things. It's, it was tough because we lost our, all of our businesses. We lost our investments. We have millions of dollars of real estate investment out there. Buyers were wanting to buy, but the banks weren't lending anymore. And, and so, yeah, so, so uh, properties, you know, uh, one by one eventually went to foreclosure. Uh, our personal home was foreclosed on. 2008, our whole year's income was $6,000. Family of four kids, I mean, two kids, my wife and I, four people. I don't know how we survived on $6,000 for the whole year. Uh, the repo man came and took the car. We had one car left that was paid for, and that was it. That's the only reason why the repo man didn't come and take that too. But it was during that time that I had to make a critical business decision. I thought, how am I going to rebuild? And I was open to working somewhere else, and I did go and work for a company. Lasted two weeks there. And the reason why I left was this here. I went on a, a client call, and when I called, uh, the, the information that was given to me was that the client is a one and a half million dollar company, and that I should go there and see if they would need our services. So, and it was business consulting services. So I went there and met with them. And it turns out that they were like doing about $150,000 in revenue. Well, if your consulting services is $100,000 to $300,000 on average, $150,000 revenue company is not going to be able to afford $150,000 of services. And so I, I call my manager back and say, hey, you know what? Just want to give you an update. This, you know, this prospect is not exactly what you know, the information said. And just want to give you some feedback so that the call team, the appointment setting team, can be aware of it. And this is what she said. She said, don't call me like a dog with your tail between your leg. Just go out there and do your darn job. Mm -hmm. My manager said that to me. It devastated me. Because I don't treat people that way. Mm -hmm. And I don't allow anybody to treat me that way. And I thought, why would she say something like that to me? And I thought, that's not the company I want to ever work for, regardless of how much they're paying. I will not put myself, subject myself to that type of treatment. So I came back home and uh, I still have my office space. You know, my business has shut down, no revenue, nothing. But I still have my office space. 
we haven't been paying, but they haven't kicked us out yet, right? And so, but I knew we were close to the end, to the end, and that they were, you know, they were just being gracious for, you know, a few months now. And uh, so I went to the property manager and I said, "Hey, I want to ask you to let us stay." And she said, "Well, I can't let you stay for free." And I said, "Well, I don't expect you to, you know, to let us stay for free. I understand this is a business and you got to collect rent and so forth." And my lease was about $2,000 a month. And so she said, well, how much can you afford? Well, this is how you know that the, it's not you talking, right? That it's the spirit talking on your behalf. And sometimes entrepreneurship is about stepping out there on faith and trusting more than what you can see, right? That's entrepreneurship. If you had all the revenue planned out and everything was given to you, that's not entrepreneurship. There's no risk involved with that, right? Everybody would be in business if that was the case. 92, 93% of the, of the population work for somebody else. Those of you who own your own business or you're helping someone build a business and as an entrepreneur, your partners in a business, you are the less than 10% of the population. If it was easy, everybody would want to do it. So I thought, how do I do this here? And, and I heard this voice. And the voice said, $500. Now, I didn't have $500. I can't even pay my car note. The repo man came and took the car. I can't pay my mortgage note. The bank is foreclosing on the house. So how do I pay for office space when I don't have a business? No revenue, no business. Everything tied to real estate was gone. Don't have a new business to get into. But I decided I need an office. Now, why would I need an office? Why? Don't, if I don't have a business, why do I need an office? Yes, I need a place to think. Because if I stayed at home, the bed was my friend. My wife and kids would be bothering me all day. It's, you know, I would feel bad because I can't provide for my family. I would feel depressed. The TV was calling my name. The fridge was like, hey, that was my sweetheart. Even though I opened it, there's not much in the fridge, but you still open it, you know? And so I knew that I had a lot of challenges at home. And I need to get up every day and go do the basics. And business is, is doing the grind work and just doing the basic. And even when no one else understands it, you get up and you do it. So I got up, went to the office every day. And when I'm at the office... One day, somebody said, hey, well, let me, oh, this is how I came up with $500. Let me tell you that part first. So I didn't have $500. So I took out my flip phone. Back then, there was not the smartphone where you can just, you know, scroll or, you know, get to the contact easily. It, it was a button. And the flip phone, you had to push the arrow down, 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 down. And I went down and I just started calling some people I knew that had a home-based business. I said, hey, you know, how's your business coming? I know it's tough. I said, hey, you know, I'm going through some tough time. Just want to check on another fellow entrepreneur, talk to Lowe. But I said, hey, you know what? I have an office space. And you're working from home. Don't you need to be in a nice, beautiful office? It's all furnished and beautifully. We professionally had a designer come and did everything. It's sold him or, or them on the, on the idea of having an office space. I found two people. They asked me how much, I said 250 each. And that's how I got my office space paid for. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that was the answer. You listen to this voice, right? And you stepped out there on faith and then the answers will come. That's entrepreneurship. You, you, you don't know how customers are gonna come and discover you, but until you step out there and say, I'm gonna create my product, I'm gonna offer my services, you don't know. But one day I went to the office and Someone I knew was having a meeting with a stranger there. And don't know what they were talking about. I popped in and I said, hey, what are you guys talking about? And the guy said, we're talking about government contracting. I said, oh, what's that? This is 2009, 2008, late, you know, middle of 2008-ish. I said, what's that? And so he started talking. He said, well, let me tell you about government contracting. He talked about the awesome women certification program, the minority certification program, the 8A program, and all these different things and that there's so few small businesses doing work in the government market that uh, he's 
trying to help business understand the government market. So you say he's a contracting officer, former contracting officer, uh, was in the military, was retired as a lieutenant colonel, awarded over $5 billion in government contracts, and now he wants to help businesses get to the government market. So he said, wow, what do you do? I said, I get up, not, I get up every day to come do nothing. <laughs> but I told him about my business journey. He said, you know what? I need someone who understands business, and he understood procurement. That's kind of how we got together. So I started, uh, we came together, started a consulting company, helping businesses grow in the government market. Uh, he became a great mentor. I learned a lot about government contracting from him. I continued to take the seed and the foundation that I learned from there. And I just started, I fell in love with the government space. And I started learning and, and every single website I can find about government contracting, I read it. I've probably visited over a thousand government contracting related website or blogs or, or anything around government contracting. Um, I've written articles, I've done many, many different classes since that point there. I've taught over 10,000 students in the government space, have helped businesses win over $900 million in government contracts. So it's been an incredible journey. But in that process, I thought consulting is great, but there has to be a better way of how we help small businesses. <laughs> there has to be a better way of how we help small businesses. So I thought consulting, we charge a lot of money. Let me start the Government Contractors Association. Hey, come on in, grab a seat. Let me start the association so that we can help businesses many, many different ways. And it doesn't matter if you, you are a million dollar revenue in, comp in company and revenue, or you can, you're just brand new. And since then, I've helped brand new companies start with no revenue from the ground up and multi-million dollar corporations as well have gone out there and done very well. So that's a little about me and, and why GC is here. And uh, so let's go into what we're going to learn today. We're going to study about what is government, what is capture management in the government space, why contracting is like art, and your current sales methodology will probably fail you in the government space, in the B2G market. If you're doing well in the commercial side and you think the same principle is going to work in the government market, you're going to learn that it's different. When we talk about the difference between business development and capture management, uh, how to develop a capture management process and how to build winning relationships and how to get certified as a capture manager. And then the benefits of being a certified capture manager and if you want a copy of the, this presentation, you go to this website, download it here. GovAssociation.org forward slash download. And you can download the host, all the slides there on this link here. Now, I share with you about, a little about my journey. Because today's theme is about government contracting is like art, being an artist. And uh, let's talk about that there. So, your business is a masterpiece, right? Does anybody want an ugly business? Everybody wants a nice, pretty business. Everybody's like, wow, right? You know, people don't even have to, they, you don't want people to ask you for money because you're successful. You just want people to say, wow, that's incredible. That's all you want. It's just the wow factor from people. So, so, so it's art. You want people to say, wow, this is, this is amazing. You did this here? And so business is like art. And, and to be an artist, you have to become a master at it. If you, if you don't become a master, then you're not going to be able to build a masterpiece. So what are some principles? The qualities of a great art. So it's so an open discussion a little bit. So what are some principles of being a great artist. What do we look for? Or what do you think it might be? You gotta be detail oriented. You gotta be dedicated and committed to, to your style of art, right? Because there's many different types of art, just like there's many types of businesses. There's services, products, there's you know small, large, medium-sized companies. So different types of art form out there. So you gotta be dedicated. Uh -huh. You got to be organized. You got you can't just um, you got to have your paper, your 
your sketch, you got to have your the right tools, the right organize all that and make sure you have the right supplies and so forth. Okay. You got to be creative, right? You got to think out of the box a little bit because if you're doing what everybody else is doing, that's not a masterpiece, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then you can't just art. Can you just go and paint the same thing? This is a masterpiece. But if you go paint the same thing, what, what will people say about you? You're just a copy, you know, your imitation. It's a counterfeit, right? Yes. You have to be original and you have to create your own art form and your own style. And so business is similar like that there. You have to go through the grind work. And I was sharing you about my story, how I went through the grind work. But in all of that, you discover who you are. You discover who your friends are too, right? When things get tough and you have no money, when you have money, everybody wants to be your friend, right? But when you have no money, if people like, they forget about you. And, and so there's some fair weather friends. And that doesn't mean that they're no, they're, that they're no good. That just means that that's the, the, the depth of your relationship. That's all that means. And so you discover who loves you deeply and who cares about you very in a, you know, on a shallow surface. So, so you got to create and create your own style of what type of entrepreneurs you want to be and, and what techniques you're going to use and what type of brush and what type of marketing strategy. Because what works for one company may not work for your company. And so business is really an art form and there is no simple, no easy process. I'm going to teach you what has worked for some of the companies that we've worked with, but it's always evolving. So today I'm going to share with you some of the methodologies in terms of how companies have used this here to go and done a lot of revenue, but what worked for them, you want to learn those principles. You want to learn the techniques, but then create your own form from it, right? Does that make sense? Don't just copy, but understand, internalize, and then reproduce it in your own way. Now, anybody know what the Mona Lisa is worth? Yellis? Do a quick Google search. Anybody? I'm, it's actually a curious fact I want to know. The value of the Mona Lisa is worth a lot. Uh, $830 million. That's a lot of money. It's priceless. That's the point, I guess. Yeah. Do you know, I met with a company last week, uh, and he won a $20 billion contract. Whoa. $20 billion contract. $20 bill. B. What kind of the IT company. So he's part of a few other companies that's on a $20 billion contract. It's ID con contract. But it's a $20 billion win. No. So, but my point is this here. You build your masterpiece in the government market and it will be worth, it will be worth more than the, the Mona Lisa. Your company is worth more than the Mona Lisa. Well, he's been building his business for about 15 years. <laughs> 20 billion. And he's a small business owner, just like you. Yeah. I mean, you know, he started off as a employee working for somebody else. And then somebody said, hey, his name's Kevin. He said, Kevin, dude, start your own business because He's a network engineer. Every time you, you come and work for our company, we need a minority-owned business. And you're, you know, you're a minority-owned business. Go get your MBE certification. He said, why would I want to start my own business? I get up when I want to get up. I come to work for you at 3 in the afternoon. As long as my work is done, you're happy. Why do I want to work, go through all that headache? And so... People, yeah, well, he didn't know that yet, right? <laughs> People kept on saying, Kevin, come on, you're a veteran. Go get your SDVOSB certification so that we can check off the box as a veteran-owned business. 
And he kept on like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So after years and years, he finally said, you know what? Everybody keep telling me to do this here. They're going to give me more contract work as an independent contractor to them. So I'll go get it. So he started his business, went and got his certifications, but didn't know government market. And so someone said, can I use your company and take that as a contracting vehicle and I will go and help you build your business for you. And all you have to do is run the company and ex help, help execute on the contract. He says, I don't have to do any sales and you're gonna come and help me go out there and do sales and bring in the contract. The guy said, yeah. He comes, okay. As long as I don't have to do anything, I'm just gonna manage the contract and fulfill the contract. You go do all the hard work. I'll keep my full-time job and, um, or do, you know, full-time job meaning that he works as a contractor to somebody else, not as an employee. I'll keep doing my contract work and, uh, and then you go hunt. Well, the first year they did $2 million, 1.8, $1.9 million. So Kevin said, wow, if I can do this here without me doing anything, let me get full time in my business. So that's kind of how he started growing his company and eventually got 8A certified and so forth. And so he's grown his company, um, but you gotta be persistent at it, right? So your business as an artist, you can create a masterpiece that's worth more than $100 million like the Mona Lisa. But what's the challenge of being an artist? Yes. Most of the time, we don't appreciate artists until they're all dead, right? So, wow, what a masterpiece, but you're dead. They don't appreciate you. you. While you're building your business, you think that your biggest supporter are your friends or your family. Sometimes they may be the biggest naysayer. Go get a job. You're a loser. <laughs> Provide for your family, right? That's just dreaming. You're just dreaming. You're chasing after the wind. And not that they say that out of love. And they call that an intervention, right? Because entrepreneurship, sometimes it doesn't make sense to the average person. Now, once you, be, once you arrive, they say, oh, wow, right? But while you're going through the struggle of trying to get your business license and get your secretary of state done and Set at your website while you go through all of that. People don't really think don't much about it. all that. They don't see all the hard work that you go through because it's easy to clock in and clock out, right? So that's that's why business is an art form, and you have to love what you do. You have to be committed to what you do. Go after it regardless of what anybody else think. Now, some you know, for a few of you, your spouse is very supportive of entrepreneurship. Your family, mother, brother, sisters, friends may be very supportive, but you have a few naysayers out there, but just keep going, right? The only people that don't win government contracts are those that stop. You hear me? It's not a matter of if you will win a contract, but when. Mm -hmm. Their families were business owners. You see, so it was passed on. Yes. Yeah. And, and because if you can see that your father did it or your mother did it, then it's possible for you to do it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So, so what does it take to grow your business then? You need business infrastructure, right? What else do you need? You need what? Prayers, yes. <laughs> you need revenue. What? Leads, prospects, customers. What else? Training, the right training and the right education, the knowledge base, right? Connections and relationships. In fact, that's going to be one of the key things we're going to be talking about today. What else? Put a few. Money, yes. To, 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 to some degree, money. Huh? Yes, yeah, standard operating procedure. You got to create standards and and create a process. Uh, you need an HR team and HR processes. 
because your most as you grow your business the the most expensive investment you'll make is into people your own team your own partners sweat equity holders uh sales people professional people around you that becomes the most expensive investment to your company so your hr has to uh, be in place so mm -hmm. if you have a small company and you have a small Mm -hmm. Do you actually hire an accountant for that part of the HR? How do you do that? There is. So, is it the chicken or the egg, right? Now, my son said, is it the chicken, the hen, or the rooster? <laughs> He's studying biology, right? He's a teenager. <laughs> so, so. So he said, okay, you know, is it the A or is it the hen or is it the rooster? What, what do you need first? Well, I don't know, you know, that, that was a hard conversation to have with him. <laughs> but so do you need HR? My question is, do you need HR before you have a lot of staff? Do you need, do you need to have staff first before you that? Or do you need revenue first before you put HR in place? It, yeah, it just all depends. Every, every situation is different. So I say, put it in when you need it. That's, that's the best answer I can have you. Like for example, uh, when you're bidding on the government contracts, some project will require, it will actually say, must have general liability insurance. Some project will say that. But on, the, on some project, it doesn't ask for it. So you don't get, you know, I'm not saying don't get general liability insurance. You get it when you, you can afford it and when you need it. Um, and so HR, you get it as soon as possible. I guess that the best answer is as soon as possible. Because <laughs> may, you may need it now, but it's not possible, right? And so as soon as possible. Right. Compliance, we'll talk more about that. Marketing, advertising, uh, business tools, software, uh, and resources like that. Uh, perfecting your product and your services, creating it, making it better, and if your product and services keeps on evolving, right? When your business stops evolving, what happens? You die. Think about Blockbuster. What happened? They died. Why? They had three chances to buy Netflix. They didn't buy it. They said, we have a footprint all over America. Every single few blocks, we have a store. We're doing billions of dollars in revenue. Why, why change? Why, why fix what's broken, right? That's the model. <laughs> yeah. You got to evolve. You get, business is constantly changing. You got to learn new information. You got you got to equip yourself. You got to surround yourself with a team. Uh, put smarter people around you, uh, and so you got to keep doing those things there. And then you got to have a sales process. And you got to close the deal. Now, there's a lot more to business than this here, but the, I just want to talk about a few things. Now, you said earlier, money. I did put money on the list here. Uh, for a reason. Why do you think money is not on here? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of like okay. Do you you know? How, don't you need money? Yes, you do. I'll tell you uh, one of my early business. I had left Motorola, and I decided that I'm going to start my own business. And I had three hundred dollars to my name. So I thought, you know, hey, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm gonna start my own business. Uh, I came back from, I went to be a missionary. I went to Thailand to go back to Laos where I'm from, uh, so that I could be a missionary for the rest of my life. But Laos never opened up its doors for me. It's a communist country, and they didn't want me to go back. I tried to get a visa to go back, and they wouldn't let me in. So I thought, well, if I can't go back to Laos to be a missionary, I guess I'll come back to the U.S. When I got back to the U.S., I said I need a job. I went to work for Motorola. I lasted. Five months at Motorola. Now, corporate America is awesome for many other people, right? Mm -hmm. So nothing wrong with P 
people working for somebody else because that's how they're wired. Most of you, you're wired differently. That's why you're entrepreneurs. And so I, I lasted five months over there and I said, you know what? I could start another business. But I had $300. So how do you start a business with $300? Right? Yeah, that's not even the shoestring budget. <laughs> so I took about, I think it was about $100 to incorporate the company. So now you're down to $200. Well, how do you build a business on that? But here's what I know about entrepreneurship. Business is not about money. What is it about? It's about relationship. We are in the people business. If you are an entrepreneur, that's the first thing you have to understand. You are in the people business. You are solving, you are looking for people with a problem and you're looking for people with a solution. And you might be part of the solution, but you may not have all the solutions. So you're, you're in the people business and you're looking for people that have a problem and you're matching the right solutions to them. That's really what you're in. And so I, I understood that. So I decided to start an office furniture company with $300. You know, the car, that table, this table here, just to feed by itself is about $75 to $100 each. So that's $200. The top is about 100, 150. That's about $300 set. Well, I, I had $200 left. I can't even afford to buy one of those. <laughs> right. So how do I go and sell office furniture when I can't even buy one piece of furniture? So, but I knew it was about people. So I started looking for people that had a problem, meaning they needed furniture. And I just started calling some people I knew. Say, hey, you need furniture, you need furniture, you need furniture. And one guy said, yeah, yeah, I need, uh, I need lateral files. So there's the vertical file. The vertical files go in to this way. Lateral files go sideways like this, sir. And he says, I need as many lateral files that you can find. Because he is a used furniture reseller. And lateral files are important for businesses. Vertical files mainly for homes. But lateral files usually for business. He says, if you find some lateral files, I'll buy from you. So I went to the yellow pages, the business pages. Back then, you know, Google was not really existing, right? So I took out the yellow pages and went to the office furniture section and I started calling people on the list. And I got to a company called, I never got out of the A section because the yellow pages is alphabetical order, right? It's, it, it's not like Google where it's, it's smart, where it will have an algorithm, you open it up and the right page will show up to you, right? And so it was AIA, Atlanta Architectural Installation of Atlanta. So that was the company name. A guy named Bradley said, yeah, I got some furniture. A lot of files, yes. I'm, in fact, it's taking some warehouse space. And if you come, I'll sell it to you for a really good price. Wow. Who remembers your first dollar? Tell me your first dollar. <laughs> How did you make your first dollar as an entrepreneur? Um, I, went to, uh, I went to a Goodwill. Okay. Uh, the section was open. Uh-huh. It was about $65, and I put it on Craigslist, and I sold it less than 24 hours for about $375. Woo! Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely remember that. Yes. Yes, uh-huh. Your first dollar. Um, well, I wonder what you said about snow. Uh-huh. Yeah, awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> uh-huh, your first dollar? Yeah. And um, the pressure washer that we had, it wasn't 
We met special watchers, but we got up there and made it happen. But long story short, we only made probably like 200 bucks because we owe home budget for all the leads. Yeah. Um, we're, we're soaking wet. We did Yes. Yes, and that's part of creating your masterpiece, right? You're you're not gonna create a masterpiece the first time you put you take a brush and you put paint on the wall, right? You, you have to get used to it, get messy, get wet, and all of that. So you know that's that's really all part of it. So anybody else? Last story. Anybody else? Your first dollar? Okay. Um, I think I've always been a visual artist. Okay. Yeah. And I make Okay. I used to be a, well, I still am, but I was a metal smith, so I put torch to metal uh -huh. And I would make my jewelry, my earrings, and put it in the back of my car and mm -hmm. go to the different clubs and sell it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So that was what mm -hmm. I would do. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. You know, hey, hands to all of you as entrepreneurs. Yeah. So part of it is you're in the people business. And uh, you just go out there and you find people with a problem and you give them a solution. So, so your sales process. What are your current sales process right now? So let's talk about your current sales process right now that you are implementing for your current business. Well, what, you, what are you doing in the commercial market right now? And we'll talk more about the government. Anybody? Cold calling, okay. What is it? Facing ass. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the ones that cost you money and the ones that is free. Okay. What else? Okay. Just just door knocking, putting on putting on mailboxes. Those are that's that's what we call guerrilla marketing, right? You're just gonna go out there and make it happen somehow. What was it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Email, email marketing. Yeah. But so many emails. And, and it, everything is effective, right? Yeah. Some are just more effective. And so that doesn't necessarily, that email is not working if people are just bombarded. But yeah, email market still works. Uh -huh. um, networking. Network. Mm -hmm. uh, People will respond to their Yeah. Yeah, networking is getting a little bit more to uh, the higher dollar projects, right? When you when you start to build relationships, you get into higher dollar. If you're dealing transactional, you don't need a lot of relationship. Because there's there's what we call KLT, right? What does KLT stand for? KLT. KLT, no, like, and trust. Yes. Relationship is about someone knowing you, liking you, and then trusting you to give you their money, right? And so the if you're dealing a transactional service, like, hey, I need pressure washing, they just have to trust you a very small amount that you're not going to steal from their home or break their window when you do. So very little trust. But you're, when you're trying to go and do the whole apartment complex, that requires, you know, you're going to pressure wash all the building and it's going to be a, you know, $500,000 project. It requires a lot more trust. So business is building KLT. And so in the commercial market, depending on your industry, some of it is more KLT, some of it is less KLT. And so, so many different, uh, some of the, all the things you share works in different capacity. But this is a quick illustration. So on the right hand side, this is from the your prospect, your client side. And on this side, this is kind of like what you go through, right? You have to do prospects. You have to find leads, um, create your prospect list first, and then they turn into a lead. So your prospect is your niche market. And so for for like for GCA, right? We're a membership-based organization. So our prospects are all small businesses. But we refine that prospect list a little bit is women-owned businesses is a better target for us, not just general small business, right? There's, in the US, there's 31 million businesses. 
and 90, according to the SBA, 99.3% of them are all small businesses. It's about 31, almost, you know, pretty much all of them are prospect. Well, that's just too much. So we narrowed down, okay, so maybe only small business that are women owned or better owned or minority owned. So that narrows it down a little bit for us. So now we actually can create a lead from that. And then we have to, once you have a lead, you have to pitch them, right? You have to pitch them by saying, by send, sending an email is pitching to them. When you're making a cold phone call, you're pitching to them. When you're out there networking, you're, net, you're making connections so you can pitch to them. And then as you're pitching to them, you're listening, right? You're listening to what they call the buying signals, right? Are they interested in your product? And, and then you're trying to qualify them as you're having a conversation with them. And then if they're interested, then you send a proposal. Well, in some situation, if it's a decent sized project, you send a proposal, but in some situation, you just say, hey, send me a quote. And so you send them a quote, and then you sometimes you may negotiate the deal, and then you close it. From the client side, while you're prospecting and lead, you're trying to create awareness, and they're they becoming aware of you, your services, your product. And then the pitch and qualify, there's a consideration on their part, like, hmm, is this something that I might be interested, or do I have a need? Do I have a problem, and do I have a need for this? And then there is an intent. When you said this, so there's an intent to purchase, and then ultimately there's a decision that they have to make. So this is, you know, this is not a perfect, you know, sales process. It gives you a little illustration of what you go through to get to um, the deal. Now, ultimately, you have a closed business deal if somebody is willing and able. They have to be willing and able. Because if somebody is willing to buy your services, well, what, what does able mean? They have to have money, right? <laughs> they have to be able to buy your product and your services. So if they're willing, that means they see a problem, they see a need, but they're able, it means they have money. So both of those things have to be in place. If, they're, if they have the money, but they don't see a need and they're not willing to buy, that doesn't work also. So you have willing and able. But the people make decisions on two main things. They make decisions based on many different factors, but if they already know, you know, as they go throughout their, their, their life and the life of their business, the life of, you know, of their own personal uh, life, they go through day to day in, day out. People make decisions based on two key things. And so when you, as a, as a business owner, you have to be able to illustrate one or the other or both. And people make decisions on pain or gain. If they see something to gain from it, they make a decision. If they see the pain, that if I don't do this, then the pain is so great that I need to take action. Ultimately, their buying decision comes down to pain or gain. And so when you're pitching, you go through this whole process, keep that in mind that they will only make a decision if they see that the gain is going to help them be better, help them make more money, help them lose weight, help them whatever, that's the gain part, right? Or that the pain is so great that they don't change, they don't do something different, they're not gonna get to where they wanna be. So it, has to, it all comes down to that. But that's your standard traditional business process here. So what's different about the government market? Uh, well, before we go to the government market, let's talk about a little bit more in terms of the commercial market, defining a few terminologies. So how would you define business development? Anybody? Training, Training yes. That's part of it. Getting to know people, all that is part of business development. Marketing, yep, that's part of, part of business development, absolutely. And then business development versus sales development. What is sales development? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So sales is closing the deal, business development is creating the process more, right? So it's, so it's a combination, but let's see, see how Google defined it. Well, business development is the creation, focus, and measurement of a plan. Sales development involves the actual execution of the plan. So that's kind of how you know, different people define it. And then a further definition is business development works with partners to sell to customers in a way that can be measured, whereas sales are simply the process of converting leads into customers. So there's no right or wrong, uh, but it's, it blends very well together, but it's, it has its own kind of like form a little bit as well. So, so, so what we're going to be talking about is we're going to take the principle and tie it to the government market in a little bit here. Marketing versus advertising. So you're, you're, you're in print, you're in uh, graphics design, another graphic designer back there. <laughs> so, so what's marketing, what's advertising? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. I say it's branding to be a product. So marketing is branding, yep, creating an image, and then advertising is the execution is the execution of it. All right. Good. So marketing, the activity of understanding the market conditions in order to identify the customer needs and creating such a product that sells itself. And then um, advertising, advertising is a part of market communication process, which is done with the aim of seeking attention of the public towards a particular stuff. And you can read through this here some more. Uh, if you guys want to download this presentation, go to govassociation.org forward slash download. govassociation.org forward slash download. And you can download all these slides here. So let's talk about the different markets and kind of see what market you're in. B2C, what is B2C? Business to customer or business to consumers. One of, you know, both of those are true. B2C, who's in the B2C business? Okay, retail is a B2C business. Okay, so, okay, all right. All right, most of you. What's the counter to that B2C? B2B. And B2B is business to business, where your ideal client is another business. And what's the market of why you're here? B what? B to G. So that's the market you're in. Business to government. And so the way you do sales to B2C, is it the same as B2B? No. If you're if if you sell if you are selling uh, pressure washing, do you go to a um, Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce event to sell pressure, wash, uh, pressure washing? Is that the most effective place? Probably not, right? You go to you go to a homeowners association meeting. And <laughs> if you're doing residential, now if you're doing commercial, yes, the Metro Atlanta might be better, right? So it depends on your audience. Uh, and some of your industry is all three. Who's all three? Okay. All right. All right. Good. Now. <laughs> what if you have the like services, the training services that you offer? What type of training? Um, construction. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, that's all, that could be all three. Um, I would say. Um, I can do to subcontractors and businesses. Yes. So, so you can do all three. Now, when it comes to training um, in the government market, I wouldn't necessarily limit yourself to just OSHA training. I would just say we are a, a we are a consultant. We do professional training, and we do uh, we do consulting services. And so when somebody says, I need 
my, you know, the government has 20 million employees from the federal, state, and local level. 20 million employees. In the commercial market, who is the largest employee in the government in the commercial market? In, in the world, or that we know in the US, I guess. Uh, out the commercial, the private sector. Walmart. Boeing has thousands, but Walmart has two, a little bit over two million employees. Right? So, but, but the government has more employees than Walmart, right? So that's my point. So if you're a training organization, yes, Walmart needs you to do training for them. The government needs training, but as a training company, you don't limit the type of things you can train. So if somebody says we need uh, Excel training. Well, let's, let's talk about Excel training. Do you do Excel training? No, the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Of course we do. <laughs> We're a training company. Of course we do. Do you do painting? Of course you do. <laughs> you know, anything tied to construction and home and businesses and the upkeep of facility, of course you do, right? Yeah. And, and so why? How many Excel trainers are out there? Dime a dozen. Right. So you, we can always contract. Sub so. out the work. All right. So if you're in the industry, don't say we do ocean training and we do this. No, you do all types of training. Okay. So if you're in graphic design and print, what else do you do? Web design? Yes. If you do web design, what else do you do? SEO? What else do you do? IT. All right, so, <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna sidetrack a little bit and, and uh, inspire you a little bit here, all right? Well, no, there's a limit. You don't want, you don't want to do computer services or funeral services, right? Yeah, so, so you don't want to do, from here to here, you, I mean, within reason. Yeah, yeah, stay within, like if you are, if you are in construction, then there, there's what they call vertical construction and there's horizontal construction, right? Those are two subsets of construction. Vertical construction has to do with buildings. Horizontal construction has to do with grading and road work and bridges and stuff. And so the two doesn't really, the equipment, the staff, it's very different, right? One is more engineering work and other, you know, concrete work, whereas the other is more, you know, the labor is different. Yeah, so very different. And so, so you know, as a electrical contractor, your best friend needs to be a plumber. Your best friend needs to be another general contractor. And then ultimately you want to position your company as a, general contracting company versus just an electrical contractor. Yeah. But you take baby steps. Don't jump out there and try to do everything at one time. Take baby steps, add one service. You start with pressure washing, then add painting, and then add, you know, janitorial and, you know, other things to eventually expand. But this company here is Motivate. And, uh, you know, Motivate? Myra, Myra told me about okay, good, good. I'm, I'm going to tell you about Buki a little bit here, right? So Buki started off, she's my Nigerian friend. I was training, doing government contracted training at a, at a woman networking event. And after I shared about government contracting, she said, she said, hey, can you help me? I said, well, tell me what you do. She said, well, I do WordPress websites. And I sub out a little bit of SEO to people. That was her bread and butter day-to-day -day business. And she said, I'm, you know, she's doing, you know, 70 to 120,000 a year. That's kind of like, it's a lifestyle business. And she said, how do I go from here to the next level? Sometimes you get in the tunnel vision and there's many options, right? Many roadways, but you get in the tunnel vision and you don't see beyond that. 
And so she got, she's a few years into a business. She, she has a ton of vision. She doesn't see beyond that. But she knows enough that I got to take my eyes away from this tunnel so I can see beyond the tunnel. So she asked for help. So after I listened to her, I said, okay, well, as a website development company, the bigger umbrella to what you do is IT. So you start positioning yourself as an IT company. Yeah, do website, do SEO, but expand to an IT company. And so we started working with her and her first contract was a subcontracting doing SEO uh, ad buys and, and social media market marketing buys for the army. She was a sub on that. She, she wasn't the prime. And the first one was $60,000. But guess what? They have come back because it's like, do they need SEO just for one month? No, they need it month after month after month after month after month. So they have come back and bought that from her as a sub over 30 times. So you do 30 times 60,000. So, so that, that was her first project as a subcontractor. Then we got her 8A certification and, and, and got that going. Her second project was doing, uh, it was staffing two people on a technical certification that I've never heard of, she's never heard of. It was, it's kind of like a machine uh, operator in a very unique type of equipment that very few people know about it. And it requires certification. And so she found, she found the project and the person said, hey, I'd like to sole source this to an 8A company. What does sole source mean? No compete, what? no competition. Yep, sole means one or only, right? And so in a sole source contract, it's a direct award to your com company, no competition, and you just price negotiate. You guys do janitorial also? So I'm tell you, uh, let me finish Buki, I'm gonna tell you about the janitorial. So that's how Buki started her company. The first, the first contract she received, that's what you uh, It was the principles that we taught her. And part of what we do is teaching you to be a subcontractor and teaching you how to build your dream 100. And your dream 100 has to do with the agency that's buying from you and the large primes that are winning government contracts and then marketing to them, telling your story to them so that they can consider you. Um, so janitorial. Uh, one of the janitorial company who's a member here, they... Uh, GSA has a building up in Gainesville and they wanted to look find a janitorial company. So they've never done a federal government contracting project and they said, hey, can you help us think this through and help us with the proposal process and help guide us through this here? And so we worked through all the numbers and um, just last week, the contracting officer said, hey, we're going to uh, award this to you. Submit your final proposal and you know, we're going to award this to you. So part of it is just consistency, right? Sole source is a type of how the government buys from you. And that's a very good method. But all these are different examples. And, and you're going to build your own journey, right? You're going to, you know, that's what we're talking about. Capture management it, It's your own strategy, your own capture uh, of uh, capture techniques that you can be using. Now in the commercial market, now let's talk about the federal market and then SLED. What is SLED? Teach you governees here. SLED is Christmas, Rudolph. Mm -hmm. All right, good, 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 good. SLED stands for state, local, and education. So these are terminologies that you're gonna be hearing from time to time. And when someone says, hey, I've got, you know, uh, there's a SLED project. Well, that means, is it a state, local, or education? So state, there's 50 states, right? Every state does business a little bit different from the next state. Alabama does not do the same thing as Georgia. Georgia does not do the same thing as New York. New York is different from California. 
And then there's count local, which is counties and cities. How many counties are out there? How many counties does Georgia have? That's Texas. Texas is about 239, 238, somewhere around there. Yeah, Georgia is about 159, 150, somewhere around there. So Georgia is number two. Texas has the largest counties, most number of counties. Georgia is number two. Every county does business differently. Gwinnett is different from Cobb. Cobb is different from DeKalb. DeKalb is different from Rockdale. Rockdale is different from Fulton. Fulton is different from Douglasville. Everybody's a little different. So, so 3,000 counties, they all do things differently. Cities, how many cities are out there? <laughs> George, I don't even know. I know the general number, there's about 35,000 cities out there. So, throughout the US, throughout the US. Just the US, we're not talking about international cities, we're just talking about within the US, they all buy from you as a business owner. What, what city are you, you live in? Latonia, they buy from, they buy your services there. What city do you live in? The little, they buy your, your services. What city do you live in? Atlanta. Atlanta has a lot of money they buy from you. <laughs> they, they, they buy from you. Everywhere you go, there's money everywhere. But you have to understand how to speak governance and how to do capture management with these. And capture management is different at all different levels, from commercial to federal to state and local and education. Education is like school systems. Uh, in fact, hospital falls under SLED as well, because they have a procurement process as well. Is so there any opportunities for government projects to work outside international? Yes. What agencies do international work? Department of Defense. DOD, military bases all over the world. Yes, and, and let me pause on that one second. So I was in South Korea, and we're talking to you know contracting professionals over there, and we're meeting with the Korean government to talk about how we can help Korean uh, Korean companies expand their business to the U.S. and help do government contracting work here as well. So commercial work here and contracting work here, and then we're talking about U.S. military work in South Korea, because US has military base all over the world. And the contracting professional, this is what they said. Hey, we don't want, we're in South Korea, but we don't want to sell to a South Korean company. We don't want to buy from them, not sell to them, but we don't want to buy from them, services or products. Why? They don't want to buy from their own people. Well, it's the US military base there working in conjunction with the Korean military, but the US have a lot of money, but they don't want to buy from Korean companies. Why? They, yes, they want to give it to US, but why? Why US companies? It's not because they prefer. So, so the, a lot of it has to do with trust, like KLT, right? When you're, this is military, and so do you want a Korean IT company installing your IT infrastructure? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to think about it. You know, yeah. Or, oh, how about janitorial, right? Janitorial is simple. There's no, you know, anything devious that they're going to come in the back door if they install you IT. Access, 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 access. Yeah, they have access. Yeah. So they're... Uh, 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 Let me find out. 
All right, if you're joining us online, that was a fire alarm. <laughs> we all had to step out for a second, but we just got the word that it was a test. So. So, so they prefer to buy from a US company and they say, you can subcontract the work to a Korean company, but we prefer a U.S. company to uh, to, to you know to to uh, sell it, sell the products to us. And a lot of reasons behind that, right? One is security. Uh, two might be the regulation. Right. Korean company want those language, right? They may not speak the language. They may not understand the regulations. They may not understand policies and processes and so forth. And so it's too cumbersome to teach them how to do that. And so if your company has a contract with the government and you sub it out, the responsibility is not on the government, it's on your company now to make sure that your subs is in compliance. And so you're on the hook and so forth. I have a question for, for um, she also is the same like you said, you mm -hmm. train them. They're not looking for me, they're looking for her. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. They're <laughs> not responsible for what you do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so so ultimately the prime contractor has the contract with the government and they're responsible for delivering. So that's state, local counties and so forth, and then education and so forth. All right. So now let's talk about what is capture management. So capture management has to do with business development in the government market. And there's some sales tied into business development, and so it's really part of your sales process as well. So when I say capture management, I'm just saying business development. But part of it is capture management has to do with you, uh, you know, being in the government market and looking for opportunities and finding the right solutions to them there. But it's similar to business development. So if you understand business development, business development, then just think of it as capture management. The difference is in the government market, the buying cycle is longer. The usually the dollar amount is higher. The average website you build, how much approximately? Okay. The average coming contract is one hundred eighty thousand. The average the average IT project is three hundred thousand. Those details, those details. If there's more money, you can afford more staff to fill in the details. <laughs> so these are like long-term contracts. Generally, like the training stuff, uh, they award. So as a training organization, the key agency you want to focus on is OPM. What's OPM? In the commercial market, it's other people's money, right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you're speaking governees, OPM is management. Office of Personnel and Management. Yeah, Office of Personnel Management. So it's it's OPM. That's the that's the agency that you know if you're doing training, business training, software training, exec, executive coaching, HR training, anything tied to training, OPM is one of the key agencies that you're going to be working with. But the buy cycle, if you're trying to win a five year contract, the buy cycle, somebody has a contract for five years and it's going to be renewed every five years. So it's a longer planning, tracking all those different projects. And so that's why we call it capture management. It's like you're, you're capturing contract. You got to have a strategy, a plan. You got to go out there and build a trap so that it, you capture, you catch that, that that um, the project that you're going after. So capture managers manages a, a manager team made up of multiple disciplines called the capture team. And part of your capture team, you got to have a capture plan for them. So this includes the marketing team, the sales team, the pricing cost estimation team, proposal team, fulfillment team, compliance team, legal team, and other groups. So let's look at a quick list here. So the capture manager leads all these efforts here. 
The capture manager is the person that does that's doing the business development, the relationship marketing, uh, some networking marketing, and looking for teaming partners, subcontractors, and so forth. That's that's a general overview. A proposal writer, the capture management, you're working with a proposal writer uh, to help write the proposals, to help you know submit bids and all these different things there. Uh, researcher, a brand manager, project manager, contract manager, compliance officer, legal team. So you're managing all these different people. Now, as a capture manager, you don't have to write the proposal, although some proposal writers are also capture managers and they can do both. So keep that in mind, but you know, you, you manage this whole process. And so it's like a project manager where you manage a lot of different skill sets to finish a project. Capture manager is a, like a project manager to some degree, you're managing capturing a contract versus, you know, versus managing a project. So your main objective is to develop a capture plan to create a pursuit plan. You also wanna source out the right opportunities Find the right one that's going to be a good fit for your organization. You want to evaluate the likelihood of success. Is this a good match? What would be successful at this here? Is it too big? Is it a go or no go? You also want to support the marketing and advertising initiative and then having a targeted, which I call your dream 100. There's 35,000 cities, 3,000 counties, 50 states, hundreds and hundreds of agencies at the federal level, you can't just go after everything. Because you're going to be like, oh, oh, there's, oh, there's another one. Oh, no, 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 there's another one, right? There's too many opportunities. So you have to focus, create your dream 100, and we have another class that addresses that. And then engage key teaming partners, because you're going to need past performance that other people have. Yeah. Like if you're trying to do IT work and most of your experience has been web and SEO and they say they need uh, to create an application that uh, manages, you know, some, you know, something. Or in your situation, you say, well, I've only built a website. I don't, I've never done something that scale. You're going to need a teaming partner that has done that scale. Yes. Yeah, you start off baby steps and get to the bigger projects. And then foster winning relationships. And that's putting in your team, your primes, subcontracting relationship and government relations in place. And then your other main objective is to facilitate the proposal strategy. You come up with the strategy, all the different components that's needed. The proposal writer writes the proposal. Now, again, some tax manager knows how to write proposals, but a relationship person is usually not a, a detailed person in terms of you know, getting locked up and typing all day, right? Some people can do both. Some people can't. Most people can't. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Even just to win the bid requires you to have a proposal writer, you know, <laughs> all these. Yeah, and so you need you need a team behind you, uh, and then develop a pricing strategy, and then closing the deal, and, um, and then ensuring fulfillment of the contract. Once you win the contract, you still have to make sure that the execution team is getting the work done. You don't have to necessarily execute the work, but if you're in a small business, you're winning the training and you're doing the training, right? And that's maybe how you start, but ultimately you're not doing, you're not getting wet doing pressure washing. Because you hire a pressure washing company to do this pressure washing. And so at some point you can do that. So there's some things. Now, just capture manager is not contract management. Sometimes people get confused by the two. Capture management is not contract management, whereas a capture manager is the pre-award before you win a contract. And you they manage the sales cycle to win the contract, whereas a contract manager is the post-award. They manage the fulfillment of the contract to completion. So keep that in mind. When you hear the word capture management, that's the sales side, and the you know, contract management is the fulfillment side. 
some other key tasks. It, it, yeah, it's, yeah, they're more like the project manager who's fulfilling the contract. Yep. And so some other tasks, you got to know, you know, the past performance and the team that you have. So uh, in terms of that, you got to research the opportunities. You got to do some email marketing and some general prospecting and developing your marketing plan, you're setting up your schedules and creating timelines of when things are coming out, assigning tasks to teams and, you know, setting up meetings and so forth. And, and, and networking, attending pre builders conference and debriefs and all these different things. Like next week, we're going to be talking, going to a lot of details in all of these things there in more details in next week's class. So I'll make sure you guys come back for that there. And the other duties too. So captain management does a lot of different things. Um, with past performance, you're trying to get into the government sector. Can you use commercial past performance as a... Uh, yes. You don't have any government past the short answer is yes, sure. unless they tell you that, that you cannot. But they don't say you know, that you cannot, then you can use any past performance, commercial, uh, residential, it doesn't matter, uh, to, for the government purposes. Some project will require that you have to have built a website for government agencies uh, or, you know, like one of the projects we worked on was a website for an IT company. Um, it says you have to have done website for higher education because it was a university website. And so they may tell you that, but most of the time they, you know, they don't go that specific. Most of the processes is the same here. And so we, we actually trained on this last week. I, I wanna talk about this here quickly. So the governments go through 10 steps to engage you. So part of your capture management is you have to understand what they go through to buy from you. Um, and um, if you weren't here for last week, go watch the video and, uh, and watch this part of it last week because we're limited with time, so I can't go to all the details here. There was another video besides this one. Yeah, we do. We record all of our sessions here. And so, you know, as a member, we have a video vault that you can go back and watch the session. Like you, you can't come every single Wednesday, but where you you come as much as you can because it's better to get it, you know, firsthand uh, information like this here. And then you and then you go through 12 steps. This is your capture management plan. You go through 12 steps to sell to the government. And we did we covered this in the last week also. So uh, I just want to remind you that this is the process of what you go through to sell to the government. And then these are the relationships that you need to build so that you can actually sell. So you need six key types of relationships. So you're the business here. The green circles here represents government relationships that you need to have. So up here is the end user. This is the government agency, the end user, the supervisor, the program manager, and so forth. Down here is the contracting office. They have the need, they, they have the authority. They can buy on behalf of the agency or the supervisor here. Supervisors can buy up to like $25,000 at the federal level. Anything more than that, they have to use the contracting office. And then the contracting offices, uh, they have the authority, but the small business advocates, they have the influence. The SBA, the S uh, small business specialist, the OSTABU, they have the influence. They can say, hey, agency, you're not meeting your woman certification. Get your contracting officer to use this company that we have here. So they have influence. So the small business advocate can actually use that. If they like it. KLT. Yeah. They can't they can't advocate for everybody, right? And they can't trust everybody they don't know. So if they trust you, then they can say, hey, you're you're an awesome business. Yeah. You know, this contract officer, they have not been meeting the woman, set aside goals, and I'm gonna shoot them an email for you. Possibly. In fact, there's some uh, risk of it changing right now, uh, at least for the DOD. So uh, there is a new policy change, and we'll see how that affects. They made a recommendation that uh, when it comes to simplify acquisition, that they're trying to go with over the sh uh, off the shelf. 
meaning that they can just buy anywhere from anywhere uh, or they can buy from large companies without going through the set aside first. So there's some changes, but you know, the, the recommendation was made, but we don't know how it's gonna, whether it's going to be implemented and whether it's gonna, how it's gonna impact the small business community. And DOD is about 60% of all federal spending. So that's a major part of money. Um, and then orange circles, commercial relationships that you need to have, you need to have relation with other small businesses, you need to have relation with large companies because they're your prime and you're gonna be a sub to them and you need to build your contracting department team down here. So those are the relationships that you need to have. Uh, actually have this video. Because the time, huh? Is that your name? Uh, yes. Okay. Because of time, I can't go to this video here, but I'll tell you briefly about the alley kitten. Winning government contract is like an alley kitten. As an alley kitten, you want to be in the house, right? But you're kind of grimy and, you know, kind of, you know, haven't bathed and stinky and so forth. And so the homeowner is not going to let you in. But if you just go show up at the door every day and purr a little bit, <laughs> purr, 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 P-U-R-R, -R, right? And purr a little bit, it's, they, they might think, oh, get out of my way. Right. And they might snudge you out of the way. But but one day they're gonna like, you know what? This kind of kid, it, is, it looks like it needs a home. It's, it does, it's motherless and it needs something to eat. And they're gonna give you a little bit of milk on the way out, they won't let you in the door, but they'll put a little bit of milk on the side so that you don't starve. And then they come back and they're going to see that, oh, you know what? It's actually, you know, it's a nice little kitty. And then they say, maybe it needs a bath and they will bathe you. And then say, wow, it needs a home. And then you're going to be inside the home. And then you're going to realize that there's a whole bunch of cats inside the house. And it's a cat sanctuary. And I tell you that story because this government contract is like that. You are a small business. You're like a little stray kitten. And you want to be in a home, but they don't really care about you because you know, you're just you're a stranger to them. So all you want to do is purr a little bit so you can get a little bit of milk. Milk is called, in the government market, we call that micro purchases. Micro purchases are projects $10,000 or less. And you just want a little bit of milk so that you can glisten up a little bit and your ribs is not showing that you can, you know, you doesn't look, you don't look desperate and starving and so forth, right? You just want a little bit of milk. You know, you, you may not have a website that's all nice and pretty, but you just have a basic website. And, and, and you may not have a business card that, you know, that is the thick ones and that, you know, is made out of plastic and so forth. But, you know, you just, you, pay, you know, 12 bucks for, you know, 500 business cards. And that's okay. That's how you start, right? So you may look a little bit, not fully ready, but get the micro purchases and then expand from that to the bigger ones. And so the Alican is like that. And it, it, the full story is actually more robust than that, but because of time, um, I can only... So... Um, yeah, yeah, that's not on, on the link. I just recorded that special. The, uh, it's an eight minute video on the alley cat story. So I gave you a quick summary there, but you get the point. So this is your capture management plan right here. You go through assessment, strategy, education, and registration. That's your preparation phase. Then you go through promotion, image marketing, uh, and then relationship building and then proposal phase is opportunity sourcing proposal writing and performance is performing delivering the work and then compliance and closure and you do that you get to profit so that download this here and you'll go to more details of that there so the capture as a capture management the marketplace in the government market there's 600,000 companies every single company needs a capture manager if you are a business owner you are the capture manager if you're working with somebody else, there's a whole bunch of different capture management opportunities out there uh, to work with somebody else. And, and here's what we did. I did a search for capture manager on LinkedIn. And there's actually over 724,000 people with the word capture manager on there. This guy is a capture manager. He's in Atlanta. 
did a search for capture manager for jobs, and there's 4,311 jobs with the word capture manager on there. So capture management is an industry that has existed, but very few people have just quantified it. Just like project managers, right? PMP certified. Anybody PMP certified in here? Nobody? Okay. Well, PMPs, project manager has been going on for every, ever since there's been a project, right? People just didn't get certified as a project manager until the last decade. Within the last 10, 15 years, everybody who's a project manager needs to be certified. Well, capture management is business development in the government market. And people have been doing it for a long time. In fact, contracting has been around since the first shot was fired in the US, right? During the Revolutionary War, um, you know, we needed uniforms, guns, ammunition for the volunteers and so forth. And so with that, Lidos looking for a capture manager. So lots of jobs in the space, people just don't know what capture management is. So GCA, we actually launched a certified capture management program. And this is our fourth cohort. So we've trained people, what is capture management? How do, you know, what you need to do to be a capture manager? How do you do this here? For your own company, some of these here, they're doing it for their own business and some of them, they're doing it for another company. So this is the last cohort that we went through. So far, we graduated 45 people who have been certified as capture managers. Uh, and we're trying to create the standard for this industry here. So, so to become a capture manager, a CCM, what, what we call certified capture manager, uh, would develop a curriculum. And in this here is a 12 weeks immersive program. The program teach the participants the technical knowledge and uh, the soft skills to be a capture manager. And then you have to go and pass an exam and you get certified there. So, so why? Because you distinguish yourself among all the other capture managers and business development people. That most, most business development people, they don't know that they're a capture manager. They, they don't even know that terminology. Because we talked earlier, right? Only a half of you have heard the word capture manager in, in before. So it helps your company to win more contracts. Ultimately, if you know processes and standards, you're, gonna, you're going to actually win more contracts. An expansion knowledge base that adheres to, you know, you adhere to a professional standard, uh, you gain a edge on your competitors and then the potential to increase your income. If you are working with somebody else, the potential to increase your income as a capture manager. The average capture manager makes how much? Sorry? So this is the national average. Now in DC, it's actually over 200,000 if you're doing capture management in the DC market. Uh, but also just more higher demand for capture management because everybody's selling to the government in DC. So, so it's, it's a high paying professional if you just want to be a professional. But if you're a small business owner, I just gave you a reason to increase your salary for yourself. <laughs> Because you're doing capture management for your own company, you need to pay yourself more money, right? <laughs> now, the average sales job is forty thousand dollars. So, do you want to do sales, just be an average salesperson, or do you want to be a capture manager? And that's what we're training people to become. If you are a salesperson, become a capture manager and make four times what you're kind of currently making. So, what will participant receive in our capture management program. 12 weeks of instructor-led classes, just like today. Every single week we get together, we, we have classes, and 120 hours of curriculum training and support. Uh, you get the Gov Fastrick software, which we sell for $2,000, uh, which takes you through 965 steps uh, of the government contracting process. You get a LMS, um, the LMS is your learning management system where you can read information or watch a video and then you have to answer questions to move on to the next step. So you, you get that as well. And then you also get Gov University. This is a video course. It's about a 12 hour video course where you I train you on 
all of the most of the training that we do here at GCA, I put into that 12 hour course there. It's a video course. Also, you get a, a training ball, which most some of you have already. Uh, some of you are already utilizing that there. And then you also receive a practice test portal because at the end, you're going to have to pass a test uh, at the end of 12 weeks. And then you get a one day boot camp to kind of summarize, you know, government contracting and some of the things that we've covered. So there's a one day boot camp at the end of all this here as well. And you get the CMBOK, the body of knowledge, training material, and the exam. And you have to score 70 or higher to pass a test. Now, if you a few people don't pass it the first time. Most everybody passes it. Probably about 95% of the people pass it the first time. Because you go through 12 weeks of training and it's fast paced and there's a lot of work that you have to put into it. Uh, and so most people will pass the test. And then you get to be certified as a professional in the industry. So that's kind of what we do. If you want to win contract for your own company, this is an awesome program for that because you need yourself to know how to do this here or if you are a sales professional working for somebody else, you need this here so that you can know the process so that ultimately you're gonna win more contract and they're gonna have a reason to give you a higher salary. And then connections and you know, you also get a business coach to guide you through the process as well. So this is a, a sample of the curriculum. So week one, we go through different things and then week two, we go through different things. And there's homework assignment after every single after every single week. So, what are some success indicators of that you're going to be successful in this program here? One, you got to have a desire to understand the government market because it's a foreign country. If you go to Japan and you want to do business in Japan, that's like the third largest economy in the world, right? If you want to do business in Japan, you have to at least speak Japanese, right? At some point, you got to learn the language. If you want to go and establish an office in Japan and expand, or you need to hire and a trainer uh, and so forth. And then you got to be willing to learn Japanese. Also, you got to have, you know, put in sales and, and you know, have sales and business experience helps you in this, in this space here. And then the ability to engage, you know, C-level executives. Uh, I appreciate occasional travel because networking and different things. Yeah, you don't have to, you stay local, right? In the within driving distance because there's military base in hour and a half in Columbus, Fort Benning, Fort Gordon is in Augusta, uh, Huntsville, Restaurant Arsenal, three hours away from here, Aniston, you know, across the border. There's yeah, lots of military facilities everywhere. So not a lot of travel, but you know, but you can travel as much as you want to once you have the resources to do that. And some other things. Here. And um, so at the end, you get a certificate. So requirement to be in the program, it's a 12, 12 weeks program, total 14 weeks with the test, the practice test, the test, and the one day boot camp. So it's about 14 weeks total. Uh, you have to set aside 10 hours a week because it's fast paced. Now it's not 10 hours like Monday till Monday night, right? It's two hours here for class, two hours to get with your study group and so forth. And so, and you can do this here um, after hours and so forth. So two hours of class time, two hours of study group, six hours of homework. So it's about 10 hours a week. Some weeks it might be less than six hours, but generally about 10 hours. Some week it may be more than 10 hours too, uh, depending on the topic we're covering. So to enroll, the investment is $5,000 into the program. It's actually very, very affordable um, to get yourself certified. And we do have, like, if you have, you know, financial needs, we do have a payment uh, plan option to help you through this process here. And then uh, to enroll, go to Capture Management Institute, um, do it online, or, or give us a call if you need a payment plan, and we can help set you up on that there. Ultimately, the goal is to help you to win government contracts. And so when you go on here, I log in so that you can get the member price of $5,000. Um, and if you, if you want, uh, if you're not yet a member, I will still honor the $5,000 price. 
uh, just give me a call and we'll set that up. The next cohort is starting up in the middle of, of October. So in about a month, but we're enrolling people now and so that we can prep. Uh, the last course we had about uh, 12, 13 people. Uh, this course, you know, as long as we have about three or four, then we launch the program. Um, and so we have about five or six people that are interested in the program already. So this is actually the first time I'm going to details about the program. Um, and so uh, if you're interested in the program, this is how you invest in your business and in yourself so that you can be just only a handful of people have gone through this process. So you really setting yourself apart from everybody else. So any questions about the uh, CCM program, being a certified capture manager? Is the certification like long? Like how long is the certification like? Um, you just renew it. Uh, there's some other details that I can talk about. You, you have to maintain continued education, mm -hmm. just like any other professional. Um, and then, you know, maintain your membership with the organization. So, but that's, you know, $200 a year once you're done. Um, every four months, maybe four months, we start a new group. 2020, it probably be about springtime when we do, yeah. Um, so this next cohort will go towards, you know, the new year. Like um, it probably will end sometime about, you know, January, February. And then we'll probably start one up in like April or something. Yeah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. You said the that that's not that. Yeah, that, that software is a blueprint. It, it takes you through the government contracting process step by step by step by step. It's including this program, yeah. If you already have it, then yeah, we try to give you all the tools that you will need in the capture management uh, program. If you, if you don't have it, it's included. If you already have it, then you know, you, you're, you're good to go. Is there a possibility of this? Yeah, you can do that there. The, uh, Go fast track. In fact, let me show you the inside of it. Um, so this is the inside of it. We use our uh, technology partner called um, Smartsheet. And so the software is broken down into you know, our phases. And then when you open up, if you say, hey, I want to learn about marketing promotion. And so you want to come here It's an image. OK, so how do I prepare my my branding, my collateral and so forth and says, OK, first thing you need is a capability statement. And then we actually provide you the samples here. And so you can actually, you know, download one of the samples. And so we put templates and you know, agreement samples and, you know, resources all in one place. And so when you come here, it says your logo, you change that out, put your logo here and change it that out. Yes. Uh, so all that's there. You need a capability brief. And so we put samples in here, create a capability brief. We put samples in here. Uh, you need to create a capability video. In fact, next week, we're going to be training about these details next week. Um, and so you're going to have those things there and then you get to that, then it comes to marketing. So marketing emails, what do you say when you email somebody and we put email samples in there. Um, so you click on that marketing samples to prime and And so we put samples in here and so forth and you know the first the first email. What should you say? The second email, the follow-up email, what should you say? Uh, now, there's no right or wrong. We just give you guide to get started. Yeah. Uh, networking events, right? Uh, we put in here all the different you know, networking events that we're aware of. So these, all these are different networking places and organizations that you, know, you can go and learn about government contracting and Remember I told you I visit over a thousand websites? So you don't have to visit a thousand websites. 
and relationship marketing, and we go into detail how to build your dream 100, and you know you get a YouTube video, and then there's a Excel sheet in here. So yeah, so it's available. If you're a member of GCA, it's not 2,000; it's only a thousand. It's 999 dollars as a member of GCA. So you actually save a thousand dollars by being a member of GCA with this software. And if you're interested in the software, uh, just shoot me an email. Um, and then this is a handout about our CCM program. And if you know anybody who's a business owner who's interested in this program, just have them reach out to me and uh, we will, you know, have them get set up. Hey, you Oh, I gave you two. Oh, you gave me two? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So this is front and back, so it's more information front and back. All right, so before we wrap up here, I have a quick quiz. So whoever gets the right answer gets the book. <laughs> Tony Robbins. And so um, money, master the game. Seven simple steps to financial freedom. And um, so quiz time. Online folks, sorry, you got to be in class to do the, to get the book. So let me come up with uh, the first person to raise your hand with the right answer. If you raise your hand and you don't get it right, don't just raise your hand because you want to be the first one to raise your hand, right? You got to know the answer before raise your hand. What does SLED stand for? I think I saw right there first. State, local, location. Okay. All right. Good job. I have to vote for the Okay, All right, well, hey, everybody, thanks for coming out. Next week, we're right back here. We're going to be talking about relationship marketing, the different marketing tools that you need to have. Um, and so it's going to be an awesome class. So come back 1030 next week. Uh, yeah, if you send email to, uh, no, that's just our website, but my, yeah, my email. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>